Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the Top 10 experimental submarines that were miserable failures. Historians generally agree that the first submarine was one constructed and successfully tested by a Dutchman named Cornelius Drebbel. The first modern submarine designed, however, was probably the one dreamed up by William Bourne. The English mathematician imagined a glorified underwater boat sometime around 1578. Bourne's sub it was never actually built, which might be a good thing given the track record of early submarines. Indeed, if he had built it, it might make its way into today's video, because all of the submarines we're looking at today totally sank. Number 10. Dr. Petit's Little Sub That Couldn't Do a bit of digging and you'll find dozens of stories of experimental submarines that tried to kill their inventors. Unfortunately, a lot of these stories aren't much more than notes in passing. In many cases, all we have is the fact that Inventor X was drowned when Submarine Y sank due to design flaw or stupid mistake Z. But Alan Burgoyne's Submarine Navigation, Past and Present, Volume 1 from 1903, gives us enough information about Dr. Jean-Baptiste Petit to tell a decent story. According to Burgoyne, Petit was a doctor from northern France with a hobby of building experimental submarines. Most writers just tell us that Petit built a submarine and then died in it. Burgoyne adds that Petit's pet project measured about 12 feet and was driven by two oars. The doctor tested his contraption at saint valery sur somme on August 15, 1834. After spending some time puttering about in the Baie de la Somme, he was satisfied with his sub's performance. So he putted over to the wharf to fetch some ballast for diving. Then Petit and his boat disappeared beneath the surface. The enterprising doctor didn't reappear until the next morning, when low tide exposed the sub lying in the mud. But he was found dead inside, apparently the victim of suffocation after his rig took on water and pinned him to the ocean floor. Number 9. U-1206 and the case of the malfunctioning toilet In 1945, with only weeks remaining in World War II, a toilet sank a U-boat off the coast of Scotland. That's right, a toilet malfunction was the reason Germany's U-1206 went down on her very first tour of duty. Unlike Allied sub-toilets, German sub-toilets flushed right out into the sea. This meant that in order to <clears throat> evacuate the toilets, German subs had to be on or near the surface. Otherwise, the water pressure coming in would be greater than the water pressure flushing out, and all that crap would come right back at you. But being near the surface if you were a submarine in World War II was a risky business because there was often a plane above waiting to drop a bomb on you. So, the U-1206 was equipped with a special high-pressure toilet that could be flushed further underwater. But in solving one problem, the Germans accidentally created another. Their high-toilet technology came with a high-tech, hard-to-read user manual and a complicated operating procedure. So complicated, in fact, that some of the crew actually had to be trained as toilet specialists before the submarine got underway. And now we have entering the picture Commander Karl Schlitt. As the story unfolds in an Uncle John's Bathroom Reader piece reprinted in Nitorama, Schlitt was not one of the trained U-1206 toilet flushes. However, that did not stop him from giving it a shot. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? So he flipped through the manual and flushed the toilet, and then the worst happened. As unwanted ocean water rushed into the submarine, the water reacted with acid from the vessel's electric batteries. This resulted in a wonderful spritz of chlorine gas that began choking the crew to death. Although, to be fair here, this probably did cover up the smell of feces fairly well. Schlitt's only option was to order U-1206 to the surface, where it was immediately bombed by British warplanes. Schlitz then had to scuttle the sub. Now we should add a couple of endnotes here. First, there's a rumor that the German officers aboard, smelling certain defeat in the last days of the war, dreamed up the toilet story so they could have an excuse to surface, surrender, and not die. Second, Commander Schlitz's official report leaves out the part about him initiating the toilet trouble, a convenient omission, if you ask us. Number 8. The Chicago River Fool Killer the story of the sub dragged out of the Chicago River mud in December of 1915 is a murky one. Probably the best research we can look at comes from Adam Seltzer, longtime Chicago author and tour guide, as well as from Cecil Adams of The Straight Dope. Here are the basics. While laying underwater cable for Comed, a diver and Eastland disaster responder named William Frenchy Desnoe stumbled across a strange submarine, partly buried in the muck. He quickly dubbed the submarine the Fool Killer, most likely in reference to the insane contraption 
Falcons, built by Daredevil Peter Nissen, who several times shot the falls in Niagara. He then pitched the story of the submarine to local newspapers to stir up interest. He even managed to obtain governmental permission to raise the sub and show it off. The timing here was pretty ideal. Submarine warfare was just picking up deadly steam in the World War I arena, so the media was happy to publish a sensational tale of a mysterious sub dredged up in stateside waters. Three months after his find, Deneau was raking in profits from his fool killer display at 208 South State Street. Oh, and by the way, they supposedly found the bones of a human operator and a dog, second in command perhaps, inside, while the sub was being cleaned out. To this day, it is unclear who built the submarine, who died inside of it, and whether or not it was just a publicity stunt by Deneau. For now, though, it remains a legend of submarine history. Number 7. George Garrett's Resurgen and the Nordenfelts Introducing George Garrett, Anglican reverend and engineer extraordinaire. This man built the steam-powered sub Resurgum, completed in 1879. The U.S. Navy deemed it slow, unstable, and unsafe to operate. Very fortunately for the human race, she sank during delivery while under tow. Resurgum is Latin for I shall rise, but incidentally, this vessel did not. Garrett's claim to fame, however, wasn't just designing a dangerous submarine, it was designing multiple dangerous submarines. After a resurgum bit the dust at the bottom of the ocean, Garrett partnered with Swedish arms manufacturer Thorsten Nordenfelt in the 1880s to make some more steam-powered submarines. These boats were called Nordenfelts, and they were just as slow and just as dangerous as Resurgen, but apparently that wasn't enough to stop people from buying them. Greece bought the Nordenfelt 1 in 1886, and Turkey, Greece's naval rival at the time, immediately ordered Nordenfelt 2 and Nordenfelt 3. Another Nordenfelt was built for Russia, but she ran aground while in tow, and the Russians refused to accept the salvaged sub. Testing of Turkey's Nordenfelt II turned out to be rather a bit of a riot. Apparently, she performed smartly in surface operations, but underwater, she acted like a seesaw. Farnham Bishop's version of the trials from his 1916 The Story of a Submarine is easily the funniest thing we found while researching this video. I'd actually recommend that you do yourself a favor. We're not going to regurgitate stuff here, so just go check it out because it's really worth a read. Number 6. HMS M2 Submarine Aircraft Carrier the Royal Navy's HMS M2 was an experimental rebuild of an earlier K-class sub. These K-class subs were known as calamity subs due to dangerous design flaws. Edward Whitman, in an undersea warfare piece for U.S. submarine force, says, Fuel leaks, explosions, fires, boiler flashbacks, hydraulic failures, and groundings were common. Indeed, one of the worst submarine disasters ever recorded was the loss of over 100 men during a chain reaction smash-up of British cruisers and K-class subs on January 31, 1918. It was upon the fine foundation of the HMS K-19 that the M2 was built. Initially, the M2 was a submarine monitor and packed a gigantic 12-inch gun on her deck. Later, she was modified to carry a plane. That's right, the M2 was a submarine aircraft carrier, complete with a hangar and a small seaplane with folding wings. All she had to do was surface, unpack her little flying surprise, and shoot the thing off into the sky with a catapult. And bam, just like that, instant reconnaissance. Indeed, here is a picture of the submarine from Popular Mechanics in October of 1931. However, on January the 26th, 1932, M2 went down in West Bay, Dorset, off Portland. Everybody on board died. A ship captain reported seeing a submarine diving in an odd fashion, perhaps sinking, at about the same time and location of the accident. M2 was eventually discovered with her hangar door wide open, leading people to speculate that the crew opened the hangar too soon in an attempt to launch the seaplane. Number 5. The Alligator That Didn't Bite the Alligator was the first submarine officially used by the United States. She was designed during the Civil War by an immigrant, the Frenchman Brutus de Villeroy, who had previously built and gotten himself in hot water for a private treasure hunting sub in Philadelphia. The Navy, intrigued by a self-described natural genius who made subs for fun, contacted de Villeroy to build them a war submarine in 1861. The result was the Propeller, a 47-footer with oars and a spar torpedo. Her reptilian moniker came later thanks thanks to a newspaper that thought her green paint and rows of oars looked gator-like. The propeller, or alligator, became a giant headache during construction. It took months longer than planned after a series of spats involving de Villeroy, the Navy Commodore, and the building contractor. It took so long, in fact, that the alligator was hilariously late to her original date, taking a bite out of the Confederate ironclad Virginia. Fun fact here, by the way, the Virginia is often called the Merrimack because rebels built her on the salvaged remains of the Union frigate Merrimack. 
So by the time the alligator was finally ready to go, officially in April of 1862, but practically not until June, the Virginia had been scuttled during the rebel retreat. So instead, she was sent off to Washington Navy Yard for a few updates. In the spring of 1863, a new and improved alligator was to face off with Confederate ironclads at Charleston and to clear obstacles from the harbor so that Union ships could blast the smithereens out of the Fort Sumter defenses. However, while on her way to Charleston, bad weather forced the commander of the towing ship to cut her loose and let her sink or risk the submarine taking his ship down with her. And that was pretty much the end of the alligator. Number four, the tale of the intelligent whale. Another experimental Civil War sub worth mentioning is the Intelligent Whale, designed by New Jersey inventor Oliver Halstead. Construction began in 1862 on this football-shaped 26-footer, which was originally meant to be the Union's answer to the CSS Hunley. However, it took a whopping 10 years before she was actually tested. The Civil War, it was long over by the time the Intelligent Whale got in the water. Now, while her name might make her sound quite sophisticated, the intelligent whale was actually fairly primitive. Her method of submerging was simply to drop anchors until she reached the desired depth. Surface propulsion was afforded by a hand crank system, but while underwater, she was quite stationary. But that's actually pretty much all you need when your method of attack simply involves a diver climbing out and setting a mine underneath an enemy ship. Most sources will say that the intelligent whale went down multiple times, killing an entire crew with each sinking. While it's true that she sank during trials, apparently due to capable operators, the part about crew killing is probably a bit overblown. If you remember Bishop, the writer we cited previously in the section about Nordenfelts, he says that no lives were actually lost on the intelligent whale. And here at Top Tens, we're going to side with Bishop because we're suckers for comedy. Anyway, regardless of who she did or did not kill, the intelligent whale never worked out for the Union's purposes. She ended up beached at Brooklyn Navy Yard. Number 3. Project Hunley War is a powerful driver of innovation, and the Civil War was the driver when submarines were in development. That's why there are three Civil War submarines on this list. We've saved the Hunley for last here because her story is definitely the craziest. Pitted against a stronger Union Navy blockading their ports, the Confederates were forced to get creative. Their bright ideas for screwing the North included mines, attack subs, and semi-submersibles. It's in this context that we meet a cotton broker and entrepreneur named Horace Hunley whose sub historian Edwin Gray described in Disasters of the Deep from 2003 as the most jinxed submarine the world has ever seen. Hunley's submarine managed to sink on six occasions, killing a bunch of increasingly brave or maybe just insane men in the process. Her reliability in the sense that she reliably failed earned her the nickname Peripatetic Coffin. For the record, here is a quick list from Gray's account of her brilliant lack of success from 1863 to 1864. Accidentally struck by the steamer Etuan, eight dead, swamped in a storm, six dead, smashed by another boat while moored, five dead, operator error, nine dead, including Hunley, sank during a dummy attack on the Indian chief, seven dead, accidentally sank herself while attacking the Housatonic, seven dead, for a final death count of 42. Which, as we all know, is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. By the way, item number six above, Hunley versus Housatonic, technically ended with a tie, but at least the submarine with six lives went down in the history books when she sank for the final time. This is because when the Hunley took out the Housatonic at Charleston on February 17, 1864, she officially became the world's first submarine to successfully sink an enemy ship. Number 2. Bauer vs. Brandauer and Cetafel Unlike many of those who sank before him, Prussian engineer and army corporal Wilhelm Bauer was a lucky man. During the first Schleswig-Holstein War, Bauer designed a submarine he called Brandauer. After trials in December of 1850, Bauer realized that he needed to make some changes. But the military would have none of that safety nonsense and ordered a public exhibition in February of 1851. The Brandauer proceeded to go down in front of a crowd, dragging Bauer and the two crew members to 60 feet under. Water pressure did its thing and the submarine began filling up. No big deal, the level-headed Bauer definitely said, as the crowd above probably rushed off to plunder his home. We'll just let water seep in really slowly while we wait here in total darkness on the ocean floor until the pressure equalizes. Piece of cake. Several hours later, all three men were able to open the hatch and swim up to safety in what is now generally accepted as the first record of a submarine escape. So now you might be wondering, well, did he give up after this incident that almost killed him? Well, no, of course he didn't. He kept right at it and designed another submarine called Cetafel. 
However, given his track record with the Brand Tower, he had trouble finding a client for this second design. But being a persistent fellow, Bauer eventually secured a contract with the Russians and built Submarine No. 2. Cetaphel worked swimmingly, racking up over 130 dives before she kicked the bucket for good. This was actually a smashing success as far as 19th century submarine technology was concerned. By the way, Bauer was on board when the Cetaphel sank too, and yes, he totally escaped. Number 1. John Day's Nightmare, the Maria We're ending this video in the same way we started it, with a sole proprietor from the early days of experimental submarines. Inez McCartney's 2003 book Lost Patrols, Submarine Wrecks of the English Channel records the comedic yet tragic tale of Mr. John Day and his submarine Maria. In 1774, an English wagon maker named John Day got tired of making wagons and figured he'd make something a bit more adventurous, and that was a submarine. Day's submarine was technically a submersible with no means of propulsion. The point was just to go down and then hopefully come back up. Day was able to make this work marvelously in shallow water by the use of exterior ballast stones that aided in diving and then, once detached from the inside, allowed for resurfacing. It wasn't exactly pretty, but it did work. After his initial success, Day decided that submerging 30 feet in a pond just didn't cut it, and he wanted to go deeper. So he joined forces with a professional gambler, Christopher Blake, who agreed to front the cash for the bigger craft. The idea was that Day would build a much bigger version of his original design and publicly test it in deeper water. His goal was to go 100 feet deeper. Blake would place bets on Day's ability to stay underwater for 12 hours, with Day taking home 10% of whatever winnings came from the event. With Blake's investment, Day bought a 50-ton ship named Maria and started modifying her. In June of 1774, the transformed Maria was ready for her show. In front of hundreds of spectators, she was towed out to a depth of 130 feet. Day climbed in with a candle, water and biscuits and shut the hatch. Then he submerged forever. The Maria dove straight to the bottom, but was almost certainly crushed by water pressure before getting there. John Day, well, he was never seen again. So I really hope you enjoyed that video, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got another channel, it's called Biographics, it's biographies of notable people from the present day, as well as history, from Elon Musk to Osama Bin Laden. You can check it out through the icon on the screen now. But if you want something else to watch right now, why not check out another Top 10s video or a Biographics video over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.